Tide Gospel Meeting begins this, this evening, or actually, I guess this morning and this evening, uh, to go through Wednesday night. Uh, you want to be here. Uh, I would challenge you, there's going to be five services. I challenge you to be here for more than you miss. How's that? Instead of saying, I, I expect everybody to be here every single day, how about let's be here more than we miss and, uh, and enjoy that. Uh, tonight, Coy Siddall is going to speak to us about Jesus being on the cross from Psalm 22 and about the promise that that fulfills and the hope that it gives us. Tomorrow night, Rod's going to share with a message about heaven being a prepared place for a prepared people. On Tuesday night, Tyler Johnson's going to follow that up with a lesson about hell being a prepared place for an unprepared people. And you don't want to be unprepared. And then Lee Rotman from Plummerville is going to tie it all together Wednesday night when he talks about that God had a plan from the very beginning. It involved heaven. It involved hell. It involved Jesus on the cross. And then along the way, we're going to suffer somewhat. So we're going to talk today about grief. Last week we talked about being content. This week we're going to talk a little bit about grief, about grief because, oh, I nearly forgot. October 30th. October 30th will be our trunk or treat night. Uh, if you're listening on the radio, that's uh, just two weeks from tonight or today because the radio program's about a week behind usually. But uh, October the 30th, we'll do our trunk or treat after evening services. It'll begin at six o'clock. Uh, plan for that. That is always a good time of fun. We're gonna have a meal beforehand uh, here at the building. Everyone in the community is invited for trunk or treat. Uh, and we're gonna talk today, like I said, about grief. And uh, not as many slides, maybe more talking. I don't know. Uh, that's what we're gonna do maybe. Grief, suffering, and loss are a part of the human process. Uh, there's nothing we can do to avoid grief. We're going to face grief at some point. We're going to have suffering at some point. We're going to experience loss at some point in our life. It's a part of life that, that we can't avoid. God gives us help, and that's what we're going to look at this morning is help that we have to cope with grief. Stories told of a homeowner that, uh, oh, I'm, I shared a lot of this sermon came from uh, David Owens. I read his sermon books, and I, I just thought this was good stuff, so I modified it quite a bit, but it mostly came from him. Uh, but uh, one day a homeowner cut down a large shade tree in his yard, and uh, the tree was so big, though, that it also provided a whole lot of shade in the neighbor's yard. And the neighbor's wife, she was really upset, Mary Lou, was really upset because she had planted her shade garden in the shade of the neighbor's tree. And so now with no more shade, her garden was going to suffer. And she knew that was going to happen, and she, she cried about it a little bit. Her husband said, but it was their tree. They could do what they wanted to with it, and it was starting to be a nuisance for them. A few weeks later, her favorite hosta, died of sunburn and, and just kind of wilted away until it was gone altogether. And, and her husband, being a, a funny guy, decided that he would have fun with his wife and say, well, you shouldn't cry about losing your hosta. You shouldn't lament about losing your hosta. Instead, you should say hosta la vista. Bit. But he thought better of it because he only wanted the hosta to be dead. He didn't want to join it. Uh, he could have been buried under the hosta. I don't know. Many people who are grieving, many people who are suffering, many people who are hurting wish that other people would stop and think before they open their mouth. That's just a true statement. Many times we wish people would just stop and think before they would open their mouth. Mark Verigo, he wrote a book, he entitled it Dark Clouds, Deep Mercy, and, and it's subtitled Discovering the Grace of Lament. Uh, really good book. I recommend that to anybody that's grieving or, or, or might grieve at some point or has a friend that might grieve, which means all of us. Uh, but uh, the book is his deeply personal journey of loss and how he learned to lament after one of his children died just literally hours before her birth. And, uh, and if you read it, you'll immediately recognize it's a subject that doesn't receive enough attention, this idea of grieving. So we're going to start this morning with two words, good grief. 
one of my favorite characters. That was one of his favorite sayings, I think. And, uh, and if we look at that and you think about it, you know, the word good or the term good grief is actually an oxymoron. I mean, it really is. Uh, when you think about it, you know, oxymoron is a figure of speech that seems to contradict itself. You know, like, uh, like uh, boneless ribs or fresh frozen or freezer burn or jumbo shrimp or small fortune or same difference. You know, I used to add uh, happily married in there, but my wife says I can't use that as an oxymoron. <laughs> Uh, anyhow, good grief. It's, a, it's an oxymoron. We don't think of it that way. But, uh, but, you know, when we're experiencing grief and pain, we don't see anything good about it, do we? I don't. I don't imagine you do either. Uh, well, let me say it right from the start. Life's full of pain and life's full of loss, and our hearts are going to be broken many times by many things. We're going to hurt. That's part of life. We are going to hurt. My wife always reminds me that the hurting that we do in life is so that we look forward to heaven and we long for that relationship, that unbroken relationship with God. And so we go through life and we feel the different hurt and we feel the different pains and we feel the different stresses of life because that way we long for that time. <coughs> Excuse me. That time when there'll be no more parting, there'll be no more tears, there'll be no more sorrow. We look forward to that. And I think maybe she has a good point there. It's not an option to not experience grief, but how we experience grief is a little bit up to us. Mark Voriga asked Joni Erickson Tada, or Tada, to write the foreword for his book. Y'all may be familiar with her. Uh, the reason she has the paintbrush in her mouth is because she's a quadriplegic. Uh, and she paints. Uh, if you know anything about her story, you know she was the perfect choice for this task. She begins the forward by saying, when a broken neck ambushed my life and left me a quadriplegic, I felt as though God had smashed me underfoot like a cigarette. At night, I would thrash my head on the pillow, hoping to break my neck at a higher level and end my misery. My paralysis was permanent, and inside, I died. She continues, you don't have to be in a wheelchair to identify. You already know that sad situations sometimes don't get any better. Problems don't always get solved. Conflicts don't get fixed. Children die. Couples divorce. Untimely deaths rock our world and shake our faith. She says, after weeks in bed, I got tired of being depressed. And I finally cried out, God, if I can't die, please show me how to live. It was just the prayer God was waiting for. From then on, she would ask her sister to get up and park her in her wheelchair in front of her Bible. Holding a mouth stick, Joni would flip this way and that, looking for answers, any answer, in her Bible. She sought the, friend of a, the help of a friend who was a Christian counselor who took her directly to the book of Lamentations. He showed her some verses in chapter 3. I'm the man who's seen affliction. It was our scripture reading this morning. Under the rod of his wrath, he's driven me and brought me into darkness without any light. Surely against me, he turns his hand again and again the whole day long. Joni marveled thinking, that's me. She was amazed to learn that God welcomes our laments. Eventually she learned, mainly through the book of Lamentations and Psalms, that nothing's more freeing than knowing that God understands and he cares. Here's what she wrote. When we are most in pain, God feels the sting in his chest. Our frustrations and questions do not fluster him. He knows all about him. He wrote the book on it. More astoundingly, he invites us to come and air out our grievances to him. Mark Variga begins his words, his book, with the words, Learning to lament began on my knees. Lord, please, no, not this. His wife, Sarah, awoke him, concerned that something was wrong with her pregnancy. She was three days from her due date. She'd spent the night without sleep. She was waiting for the baby inside her to move, and it hadn't moved. She spent hours tapping her tummy, shifting her positions, and offering tear-filled prayers, but by morning time, the baby had still not moved. 
This was their third pregnancy. They had twin boys, and then they had another son. And in four years of their marriage, God had blessed them with three beautiful children. But not everything had been a breeze. Mark, as a young minister, was very busy with his work. She, with raising three children and and a new pregnancy, had been very busy. Later that day, they went to the doctor's office. And the monitor and the sonogram confirmed what they both feared most. The baby was, in fact, not beating. The heart was not beating. A few hours later, they entered the hospital where she had to go through labor to deliver a beautiful, perfectly formed, nine-pound baby girl. The one they'd been praying to God about. The little girl that they had asked God to bring into their lives. He did bring into their lives. And they didn't understand. Sylvia was beautiful, but she wasn't alive. Thoughts about the future raced through his mind. How are the boys going to respond to this? They don't understand. They'll never understand. Will my wife ever be able to be happy again? Can our marriage survive something like this? How can I live? with this kind of pain and stand up Sunday morning and minister to a congregation. He had no idea how to do that and in the middle of it he started looking for hope in his Bible and passages that would help him and he'd read all these psalms, he'd read all these lamentations before but but he'd never really heard them from this perspective. And I think most of us when we go to our scriptures in times of need, we're reading from a different perspective, and, and he was as well. And, and during that journey through grief, he found a language that he called biblical lament, and that's what he talks about a lot in his book. He says he believed God will somehow work everything out for his good. That's what God says. All things work together for good for those who love God and are called according to his purposes. So he believed God would work everything out for good. He just didn't see how this could be good. He didn't see how this could help at all. And and in fact, once he found himself in the middle of of suffering, life became a roller coaster. I mean, it was up one day and down the next. And just about the time you thought you'd come out of the bottom of one of those things, there was another loop sitting in front of you and and there was hurt and pain and all kinds of things. He said he could see that the laments became his guide to coming back to God. All the years that followed were really tough. They suffered four more miscarriages and they had a false positive pregnancy along the way. But eventually, they managed to come out of this okay. And I believe for us that learning how to properly lament, learning how to properly grieve, learning how to properly come to God with the things that hurt us the most will help us as we travel through the roller coasters of life as well. Perhaps you've already learned to sing this song of grief. Maybe you've had to deal with that already. Uh, The picture up there is Toby Mack, a famous Christian singer who lost a son, and that's his first concert after he lost his son. As he sang to his son, or in honor of his son. Uh, Maybe you've already learned how to turn to the Psalms. Maybe you've already learned how to turn to lamentation, to look for comfort. Uh, One thing I know for sure is that if you haven't gone through any grief and loss in your lifetime, you will. I'm 62 years old. In 1988, I lost my grandpa, my granddaddy, and my dad within about four or five months of each other. Uh, In 06 or 07, I lost my mom. Uh, Shortly after we moved here, my grandpa died, and a couple of years ago, my grandmother died. My wife's lost two of her three brothers. My grandma was her grandma because she didn't have a grandma by the time we got married. Uh, She lost her dad. We've got her mom left, And, uh, and we love her mom. I call her mom, too. She's my mom now. If you live 
long enough, you're going to lose friends. And you're going to lose family. It's going to happen. You're going to have to grieve. And, and it's hard. It's not easy. And, and anybody could think that, you know, thankfully, we haven't lost either one of our children. But we nearly lost Kristen. She was crossing uh, a street, had a, had a green light, and some guy doing over 60 miles an hour plowed into the side of her car on the driver's side. And that could have been fatal, but it wasn't. God blessed us and blessed her. Uh, Brian was blown up twice by IEDs in Iraq and Afghanistan when he served. You know, God has been merciful to us. But there have been situations that have caused grief and stress in our lives. And I'm sure that everyone listening to this lesson has your own stories of grief and suffering and the things that you've dealt with in your own lives. I'm sure all of us have that. Two things I think that we need to understand. And I think maybe it's very clear that we need to understand them is we need to ha know how to get through grief and then how to be with others as they go through grief. We can have all the right attitudes and not have the right words. Mark Volregop discovered during his journey through grief that many Christians were not only unfamiliar with how to deal with grief, but they were very uncomfortable with dealing with grief. And he was talking about Christians and two Christians. Uh, some reacted with awkward silence. Or they would change the subject. Maybe even tell a joke to try to encourage you. And, uh, and uh, some got physically uncomfortable enough that they just left to avoid having to talk about the situation at all. And others tried to find the bright side. And so they wanted to offer encouragement. And they meant well, but what they said wasn't exactly right. Well, I'm sure the Lord will give you another baby. Well, you know, maybe more people will come to faith when they see how you handle this situation in your life. Or the one that hurts the most sometimes is, well, you know, the Lord, he must know he can trust you with this. Or, or maybe God, God wanted your baby in heaven more than you needed him on earth. Or more than you needed her on earth. Do those give you comfort? When someone says those words to you and you're in the middle of grieving, does that give you comfort? If it does, you're kind of weird. I, I, I don't understand that. We, we seem to think that, that our words sometimes are going to bring people comfort when the, when the words, you know, I've been guilty myself of saying things like, well, he's in a better place or she's in a better, and they are. But the one that's grieving is not in a better place. You're not in a better place when you're grieving somebody that you've lost. Or when you're grieving a relationship that's been destroyed. Or when you're grieving a world that's not following the ways that you think it ought to follow. You're not in a better place. And we ought to be able to lament a little bit and to understand it. Maybe you've read about the stages of grief. I have. And maybe you know the stages people are going to go through and you understand that and, 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 and you try to stay out of the way of it and it can help at some level to know that. But there are no quick answers for grief. There are no quick answers for heartbreak. There are no quick answers for pain and suffering and things like that. Maybe sometimes we ought to step back and let somebody actually deal with their sorrow. Let them deal with their sorrow because if they don't deal with their sorrow, they'll never get over it. They'll never get past it. By the way, that's a very biblical concept. Under the law in the old days of the Old Testament, under the law, if you lost someone who was a near kinsman, a near relative, generally a husband, a wife, a child, a parent, you were required to grieve for one year. For one year from the date of that loss, you're required to grieve. During that year, you don't attend any feasts. 
You don't attend to any celebrations, no matter what. You don't celebrate birthdays. You don't celebrate the birth of a child for a family friend or something like that. You don't celebrate anything. You're not allowed to attend. You wear your grieving clothes the entire year so that everyone who sees you knows that you are grieving. And they do not offer you any words of encouragement or any words of positive value other than, oh, I see your suffering. And that's all they're allowed to say. They're not allowed to say it's going to be okay. By the time the year had elapsed, most everybody was ready to move on with their lives. They were ready to take off the grieving clothes. They were ready to go to a celebration. They were ready to move forward with their lives because they had taken the time to properly deal with their grief because they weren't distracted by all the rest of the world. So that's a biblical concept. In our world today, well, you can get three days off with work from work, maybe a week if you've got a really good employer. But then we expect you to be back on the job, and, and you ought to be over it by now. It's been a week. Sometimes I tear up at the memory of a friend or of a loved one that's been gone for 20 years. And I'm supposed to get over it in a week or a day? Maybe we ought to think about that. Psalm 13 is a good place to go to when you're trying to think about that. The psalmist David, in this case, writes, How long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I... Oops, sorry. Get back there. How long must I take counsel in my soul and have sorrow in my heart all the day? How long shall my enemy be exalted over me? Consider and answer me, O Lord my God. Light up my eyes, lest I sleep the sleep of death. Lest my enemy say, I've prevailed over him. Lest my foes rejoice because I'm shaken. But I've trusted in your steadfast love. My heart shall rejoice in your salvation. I will sing to the Lord because he dealt bountifully for me or with me. You know, you see how it might give you a voice or a chance to voice your own pain and your own suffering? It's only six verses in the little psalm. But man, how, how often do we wonder why we're having to deal with grief? How often do we question, why do I have to have this pain? How often do we want to ask God, why God? Why me? And we want relief. And we want answers and we want help and it's and it feels sometimes like God has abandoned us I and mean, we know he hasn't but it feels that way like Jesus on the cross God didn't abandon Jesus but Jesus on the cross says my God my God why have you forsaken me because it felt so lonely hanging on that cross for my sins and your sins broken hearted like us understanding what we go through but David ends his psalm in such a great way he expresses his trust in God he expresses his trust in God's faithful love he, he expresses his hope that God will still take care of him and then he says I'll sing praises to you I'll sing praises but that's not what it says Look at what it says in that last verse. I'll sing to you. Sometimes the songs we sing are sad. Sometimes the song we sing to God is a sad song. God, my heart's broken and I need you. Till the storm passes over, till the thunder rolls no more. You know, we, we, we look and we need sometimes a way to come to God and to let him know how we hurt. From those kind of psalms and from the laments that we find in Scripture, we find all kinds of hope for life in dealing with this. I love this quote from Mark Varego's book, Varego's book. Lament is how you live between the poles of hard life and trusting God. That's how we bring our sorrow to God, with lament. And, and we don't use the word lament very much. You're, did you ever tell anybody, uh, I'm sorry, I can't, I can't do whatever today I'm lamenting? I just don't feel like it today. I'm lamenting. I, I, 
I don't, I've never heard anybody use that word in a sentence that way. I'm sorry I don't feel like going, my heart hurts. I've heard people say that before. Felt it myself, said it myself, thought it myself many, many times. Maybe we need some way that we can find a way to turn our pain over to God. And maybe that's the way to do it, is to really, truly allow him to help us with that. Without the lament, there's no way for us to find help. Without the sorrow, there's no way for us to seek help. And there are passages, many, many passages in Scripture where we can see where others have dealt with the same pain we have, and we can pray their prayers as well. How long, O oh Lord? How long will my enemies triumph over me? How long, O oh Lord, will it seem like your face is far from me? I lay awake in my bed at night and I can't sleep because of my sin. I don't know any way to come to you to talk to you about what it is that's got my heart breaking right now. But here it is, and, and you go through it, you'll find it. Whether it's a sin issue in your life. Go to Psalm 51 and see what David has to say about that. Whether it's a heartbreak in your life. Come here to Psalm 13. Go to some of the other Psalms. Go to some of the, there are several Psalms that are lamentations. And go to those and read them and see if it doesn't apply in your own life right now. The one thing I know for sure is we need God. That's what I know. You know, we need God when the sun's shining and we need God when it's raining. We need God in the bright times and the dark times of our life and the good times. We need God in the desperate times. And he wants us to turn to him, especially in the hardest times, and lean on him. And the laments that we find in Scripture give us the words sometimes that we don't have here. I don't know about you. I know about my prayer life, that there have been many times when my prayer has simply been, God, I, 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 and, it, and it sounds like that. I don't have the words. I don't know what to say. I don't even know where to start. And so we go to something like this and we find a starting place to open our hearts up to our God and our trust in Him. So here's what I hope we carry from this morning's lesson. Death continues to impose itself on us, you know, whether it's death by natural causes like old age, uh, Alzheimer's, cancer, death by accidents, crime, violence, all kinds of things like that, or maybe death from COVID-19. You realize one out of every thousand people on earth has died of COVID-19? COVID one out of every thousand people. You say, oh, that's not that big. There's not a thousand of us in here. But you probably know somebody who has. And you probably know more than one person who has. You know, but when we turn to God in these times, what do we say? We find ourselves grieving the loss of life during the pandemic. I mean, even this morning, Judd says, don't hug anybody. Don't touch anybody. Just nod at them. Don't you miss hugs? I remember Jennifer coming up to me and she said, I miss my hug. When are we going to start hugging again? I said, I'll take a hug right now. <laughs> we need that. We need those relationships with each other and we need that closeness with, e with each other. We mourn a time when we could gather together and not have to worry about things like that. And we miss that. We mourn our jobs and economic losses. If, if you haven't been paying attention to the world around us, COVID has affected our nation. COVID has affected the whole world. And the economy of the world is not in very good shape right now. All of that, and, and the coming back from it, and I'm glad we're coming back out of it, it's, it's a whole different world, isn't it? Doesn't the world look different? You go to a restaurant and it's closed because not enough people showed up for work. Everywhere you go, there's a help wanted sign. And the problem is nobody wants to work, I guess, because it's constantly that way. We find ourselves grieving the loss of some of our, our, our moral fiber in our nation as our biblical ethics are just kind of been thrown by the wayside. You know, and it's led to the breakdown of marriage. 
led to the breakdown of families. It's led to many people grieving and suffering through divorce and domestic abuse and violence and abortion and, and drug addiction and suicide and all kinds of emotional and psychiatric difficulties that we see in the world around us. We're nearing a point where nearly everything is possible and accepted except standing up for God's values. You know, we also find ourselves looking at government and wondering how in the world is we ever going to fix this if every time one side says yes, the other side says no, regardless of what they believe, simply because they're on an opposite side of an aisle. People can loot and burn and rape and murder and say they're doing it in the name of social justice and that's perfectly acceptable. There's no consequence for their action. Meanwhile, if you stand up against crime or you stand up against evil, you're labeled a bigot or a racist. But at least finally, as a nation, we're starting to address some of the inequities that there have been for many years for people of a different color. You know, we're starting to recognize that sometimes people were, in fact, discriminated against because of their color, even though we passed a law saying it couldn't happen, it was still happening. And we're finally seeing some help along those lines, maybe. Maybe it'll lead us as a nation to lament a little bit as we look back and see what we had and what we could be, and maybe we'll come out of this better off. For those reasons and so many more, we need the Lord. Because only God knows what's right and best. Only God has the power to sustain, the power to heal our broken lives, our broken country, and this broken world. So we turn to God to express our grief and to find peace and grace. And may God bless us as we journey to find the comfort that comes from him. With his help, it can be well with our souls, even when sea billows roll. You know, this morning, we've seen a very real need to grieve properly. I hope you've seen that. I hope you realize when somebody's grieving that you can help them sometimes best by being like Job's friends. When they came upon Job and he had lost everything, and the friends came and they didn't even recognize him because of the state of despondency he was in. It says they sat down beside him and they didn't say a word for a week. They were there with him if he needed them, but they didn't try to fix him. And sometimes that's the best thing we can do. Maybe you need prayers this morning. We're here. Maybe you need to come to God or maybe you need to come back to God. We'll help you in any way we can. If you'll come while we sing to encourage you.